Welcome to Forensic Friday. I hope that this is on Friday, I really don't know, where I tell you one true crime case that was solved using forensic science all while doing that's right, my makeup. Today's video will be featuring the Pretty Guardian palette. This is the Sailor Moon in collaboration. I have the ultra blotted lips here as well, so we're gonna be using this. This was the most Valentine's Day looking palette that I had in my collection, so that's why I decided to use it today. All the other products I'm using in this video will be linked in the description below as usual. Please read the disclaimer, I'm not a professional at anything. I'm not a professional forensic pathologist, nor am I a professional makeup artist. I am just the average girl at home, like you, playing in my makeup while I talk about a true crime case. So if that's something you're into, then please, you are more than welcome to stick around and hit the subscribe button. Also, quick reminder, the comment section is a privilege. Don't fuck it up. Now let's get into today's case. This all takes place in 2003 in Concord, California, where a young mother named Kathy Lorick lived with her husband and beautiful children. Kathy worked as an executive secretary in a very, very busy office. Her job was very demanding and sometimes hectic. So to release stress throughout the day, Kathy would oftentimes take walks. She would take these walks on a trail near her job. She would also use this time to make some personal phone calls, you know, to call family members and friends, anything that wasn't a professional business thing, something she couldn't do in the office, she would use this time to do on her walks. It was a beautiful mid-afternoon when Kathy set out on her stroll for the day. Kathy's husband had been out of town on business, so while on her stroll, she decided to call him up and, you know, just to check in to see how he was doing on his business trip, how everything was going, which is something she would often do. She would either call her husband or her children just to make sure everything was going correctly. Unlike my makeup today, <laughs> seems like we're getting to an awkward start. Kathy's husband is giving her the lowdown on how his trip has gone so far when all of a sudden he hears a loud grunt from Kathy and he hears the phone fumble before it goes silent and is completely just shuts off and goes dead like it's disconnected. Now Kathy's husband knew that something was not right. After numerous failed attempts to call Kathy back, her husband became concerned and he called the office where she worked. But her coworker said that they hadn't seen her and she hadn't come back to the office yet. Her husband was super concerned at this point. He asked coworkers to search for Kathy. Coworkers set out looking for Kathy along the trail she always took that was near the office, but they couldn't find her. So they returned to the office and called the police. Something obviously is not right. When police arrived and searched the trail, they found what appeared to be a long trace of blood. It was like a smear along the trail. Officers followed the trail of blood until they came to a ditch off the side of the trail. In that little area in the embankment, in some leaves, they saw what appeared to be a woman's body. There, they discovered Kathy laying in a pool of blood. She had been brutally beaten, but still alive and breathing. She was partially nude, which insinuated that there was some sort of sexual assault that may have taken place. Kathy was so badly beaten that she couldn't even speak. So she was hanging on for dear life and the cops needed to do something quick. So they called paramedics. It was evident that Kathy needed immediate attention. Paramedics arrive and they rush Kathy to the hospital but she doesn't make it. She ends up dying in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Crime scene investigators located what they believe to be the murder weapon, a fence post that was approximately two feet long. So they believe that this fence post was what the perpetrator used to beat Kathy with. Oh my God. I mean, that's terrible. Just imagine you're taking a walk. You're just taking your daily stroll in the park and then all of a sudden, this ish happens like actually don't imagine that i don't want you guys manifesting shit like that seriously i mean she probably didn't even hear the assailant when he snuck up on her always pay attention to your surroundings because you know sometimes we are so enveloped is that is that a thing i, I don't even know if that's a thing we're so 
into our cell phones all the time that we barely see what's going on outside of us. I know we all have these electronic devices and cell phones that really capture our attention, but we have to be really careful with these things because sometimes it can distract us from our reality, our real outside world, and that could cause, you know, weird things to happen. Okay, so just just be aware. Be aware of your surroundings and don't have your nose in your phone too much, okay? <laughs> and that's not just a reminder to you guys, that's also a reminder to myself because I have my nose in my phone all the time too, so I'm not even, I'm not judging. Investigators contacted Kathy's family and told them the news and of course they were devastated. Her son, he was so upset he didn't even know what to do he just started screaming at the officers asking them how could this happen because he just really didn't understand i mean kathy was a good woman she was a good mother she was a good wife she was an excellent worker and employee so they couldn't fathom in their brains why something like this would ever happen to a person that is that Good of a person you know it's like she's just a normal woman now when they spoke with kathy's husband he told police that he was on the phone with kathy when the incident occurred now although he was on the phone with kathy when the attack occurred kathy's cell phone was nowhere at the crime scene autopsy was performed on kathy's body and the autopsy report revealed the cause of death as blunt force trauma she had several injuries to her body. The most prominent one was to her head. There was a huge gash there. They also performed a kit on her and it came back positive for assault. Although they did not physically have her cell phone, they did take a look at her cell phone records. They found out that her phone pinged off of a nearby tower recently, like right after her death. So if she was already dead, then who was using her phone? Mm -hmm. Someone was using Kathy's phone. Police contacted the numbers on record that had been called during this time. One of the callers told them that they were talking to a guy named Juan Sanchez. Now Juan Sanchez was a young Hispanic male. He would often take bicycle rides along the trail. Authorities were able to locate Juan Sanchez and they searched his apartment and guess what? they found Kathy's cell phone in one of his bags. I mean, if you're gonna do that, make it inconspicuous. During questioning, Juan told investigators that he found the cell phone on the trail while riding his bike. He noticed that the phone was still working and so he picked it up and took it for his own personal use. He stole it. Well, not really, because he found it and he just kept it. Anything that's trash that's thrown away isn't theft if you pick it up so probably it's not it's not theft but Juan was absolutely cooperative with investigators he didn't give them any problems he answered all their questions and he, he didn't seem suspicious so they asked Juan to take them to where he found the phone and sure enough he takes the police down to the trail and shows them the exact spot where he found the cell phone it was about 50 feet away from the crime scene where Kathy's body had been discovered how did the cell phone end up so far from Kathy's body yet so close that's what investigators needed to find out it was evident that the killer had taken Kathy's phone off her and placed it there. Now the fact that the murder occurred in broad daylight shocked and terrified the community. People were afraid to take walks on the trail anymore. It was pretty sad because people loved that trail. It was There was access to that trail all over. There was access to that trail from the neighborhoods. People were being extra careful on the trail. A lot of women didn't want to take the trail anymore. I mean, they wanted to take the trail. They didn't want to stop using the trail that they walked every day. However, because of this incident, they just didn't feel safe. Now there was a group of homeless people that would occupy a space not too far away from the trail, it was like along the trail. Um, could one of them have possibly done it, police were thinking. They weren't sure, but they were definitely looking at all of the options. Forensic scientists analyzed the fence post that was used to kill Kathy. The first thing they did was dust for prints. 
However, nothing came back. They found no fingerprints on the post, which I think is even bizarre because like if it was out in the open like that, there should have been some even from the workers that installed the post. Next, they sent the DNA from Kathy's rape kit to the statewide DNA database of known criminal offenders. The results came back with no match. They also tested Juan Sanchez's DNA up against the DNA from Kathy's rape kit and that also came back negative, eliminating Juan as a suspect. Police are still at square one. Desperate for new clues, investigators returned to the scene of the crime to talk to the witnesses that were on the trail that day. Half a dozen witnesses came forward to say that there was a very odd man on the trail that day. They said that there was a man on the trail that was bringing a lot of attention to himself. He was looking over into the canal where the fish were and he was pointing at the fish and he was like just going on and on about these fish like something's wrong with the fish. It was rather bizarre. He was just attracting a lot of attention from passer buyers and he would be asking them like, hey, did you see these fish in the pond? What's wrong with these fishes? I don't know. The man was, the man was nuts, okay? The fish are just swimming like fish do so what are you going on about I wouldn't have even gave him a minute of my time I'd have kept walking there's no way I would have stopped all of the witnesses described the man as a 30 year old slightly overweight white male about six inches tall with brownish blonde hair they said that the man looked unkept he may have been homeless so two of the witnesses told police that they believed they would be able to pick him out of a lineup so police took those two witnesses into the station for further questioning investigators brought in a sketch artist to drop a composite of the possible unknown suspect the crazy thing is despite the two witnesses never even meeting or knowing each other they both described an eerily almost identical description of the man they saw that day. Outside of one of the witnesses saying that they saw the guy wearing sunglasses, the two composites looked identical. Investigators believe that this was the same person. Now it's time to go into the palette. But anyway, back to the story. Although they had the face of a potential suspect, they didn't know where to find this man. So investigators brought in the K-9 unit, which basically are doggy detectives. They're so cute. I love it. There's no cat detectives, except for my detective, Lucy Cat. She's the only cat detective because she's special. These doggy detectives scoured the area looking for clues. The K-9 unit started at the crime scene. Once the doggy detectives picked up a scent, they led investigators back to a neighborhood near the wooded trail. Police learned that there was a man living in that residential area that matched the description of the sketch composite. His name was Mark Fisher. He was a known nuisance and a very violent man. He had been arrested for getting into fights with family members and being violent towards police. Investigators asked witnesses from the trail to pick out the guy that they saw on the trail that day out of a photo lineup. Three of the witnesses positively ID'd Mark Fisher. Time to pick him up. Let's go. They told investigators that they were 100% sure that it was Mark Fisher they saw on the trail that day. I mean, 100% is a lot. Investigators needed to talk to this Mark Fisher. So they went to the home of the relative that Mark Fisher was staying with at the time. Upon arrival, they were met with the relative who told investigators that Mark Fisher had actually unalived himself. I mean, well, that's a coinky dink. What are the chances that this guy does that? He had jumped off of the Golden Gate Bridge. Investigators were stunned. It had only been 24 hours since Kathy's murder. Innocent until proven guilty, but it is very, very strange. Investigators theorized that Mark had unalived himself because of the guilt. They searched and seized various items of evidence from Mark Fisher's bedroom. Amongst the items that were collected was a pair of sunglasses, a bloody t-shirt, and a newspaper that was open to the article section about Kathy's murder. I mean, the circumstantial evidence is like really pointing to this guy. There was also a description in the newspaper about the killer that he had sectioned off. Why would he be looking at that? I mean, I don't know though, because 
some people are into true crime like obviously i'm into true crime so i would look at that stuff and maybe you guys would look at it but i don't know it's just it's still bizarre it's still weird and it's still something to look at even if it was just harmless and him just you know checking out the story or whatever maybe he was nervous as well because he took the trail too that somebody would get him all of the circumstantial evidence pointed to Mark Fisher being the killer. Police was certain that this was their guy. But did the scientific evidence match their theory? Forensic scientists extracted Mark's DNA at his autopsy and compared it to the DNA from Kathy's kid. The results came back and it was not a match. He wasn't the killer after all. That's crazy. This put investigators back at square one. If Mark Fisher wasn't the killer, then who was? It was a scary thought that the killer was still out there roaming the streets. Investigators knew they needed to act fast, so they issued a DNA dragnet on all of the homeless men that had criminal backgrounds in that area. I feel like they were just digging at this point. I kind of don't really want anything on the bottom. Is that crazy? What do you guys think? Should I put something on the lower lash line or not? Forensic scientists tested 42 men. They compared all 42 men's DNA to the DNA found at the crime scene. All 42 tests came back and guess what? They were negative. None of the men matched the DNA found at the crime scene. Oh my God. <laughs> As you can imagine, investigators were starting to lose hope until nine days later when a mountain biker came forward and said that he had met a man on the trail that day that fit the description of the sketch composite. Now listen, we they didn't already interviewed like dozens of people on that trail who ID'd Mark Fisher and it wasn't Mark Fisher. Maybe this guy is thinking that it's Mark Fisher too, but he don't know that Mark Fisher is dead. According to him, he was on the bike trail when he decided to stop and have a smoke. While he was having a smoke, a man walked up fitting the description of the sketch composite and asked for a cigarette. He gave the man a cigarette and they chatted for a while. He didn't get the man's name, but the guy talked with him for a good minute. He had one cigarette and the man had two cigarettes before they parted ways. The biker also took police to the exact location he was standing with the man when all of this occurred. And guess what? The cigarette buzz that they had tossed on the ground was still there. Nine days later, it was still in the same spot. Investigators were so excited because they're thinking, maybe this is our chance to extract some DNA from the cigarette bud, which could possibly lead to a potential suspect. So they're getting excited like, oh my God, the buds are actually still here. Now, although the biker did not get the man's name, he did say that the man had talked about working at a telemarketing company that was located in Walnut Creek. Walnut Creek was a small town nearby and there was only one telemarketing company in that area. So investigators went down and they spoke to the manager of the telemarketing company and instantly the telemarketing manager knew who they were talking about. And in fact, he said, I believe the man you're looking for is Robert Frazier. So obviously they know what this guy is up to. They've seen his past. They know something if they would point him out like that. Like, wow, they gave him up real quick. They went on to tell police that Brian had actually quit and it was around the same time that Kathy had been murdered. Robert Frazier was a very troubled man and a background check revealed that he had a criminal past. He had served time in prison for committing robberies and while in prison, he also committed very violent assaults on other inmates. Investigators were able to obtain the last known address where Robert was residing. It was actually his ex-girlfriend's place. Go figure. When police arrived, Robert's ex-girlfriend told them that Robert had left, that they broke up and Robert had just took off and she had no idea where he had gone. She said that he took everything all except for a toothbrush and she handed that over to investigators. The toothbrush was sent to the forensics lab for testing. Wow, my lips are so chapped. You guys were sitting here looking at my chapped lips this entire time. You didn't tell me that I needed a chapstick. Girl, 
When the results came back, forensic scientists found DNA from three different people on the toothbrush, including male and female DNA. Forensic scientists tested the cigarette buds and compared it to the DNA found from Kathy's rape kit. Next, they compared the DNA from Robert's toothbrush to the DNA found on the cigarette bud. And guess what? You already know, it matched. They also discovered Robert's DNA on the fence post, which was the murder weapon. This confirmed that Robert Frazier was in fact the killer. Now all they needed to do was to find Robert. To find Robert, investigators ran Robert's name through the NCIC database, which if you guys don't know what that is, I do explain it in another video, or if you subscribe to my channel, I might explain it in a forensic facts video. Investigators ran his name through the NCIC database and discovered that he had recently been incarcerated. Now he had been in Indiana and gotten pulled over for a traffic violation. When they ran his ID, they found out that he was actually on parole and his probation officer was looking for him. So that is how they found him. They arrested him on site. Investigators flew from California to Indiana to speak with Robert. Robert was very cooperative and during the interrogation, he was relaxed, he was talking, he was laughing, he was joking. He just seemed very relaxed and not suspicious at all. Now, when police asked him if he knew Kathy, he said that he didn't know who she was, he's never met her before, but that he had heard about her and her case. And when police heard this, they were like, hmm, interesting. Investigators questioned how he had known about Kathy's case and he told them that he saw it on TV and in the newspaper and you know he was aware of it because he was living in the area at the time. They asked him if he knew what Kathy looked like. So he starts to describe Kathy and as he is describing her, he ends up leaking information that only the killer would know. Without even knowing, he describes her as a woman with brownish blonde hair and freckles. Now, this was especially interesting because in the photo that was released of Kathy, she didn't have freckles on her face because she was wearing foundation and her face makeup covered her freckles. So no one would have ever known that she had these freckles. However, she did have freckles all over her body. This information hadn't been released to the media. In addition to all of the scientific evidence, circumstantial evidence, now Robert had admitted to something that only the killer would know proving that he was, without a shadow of a doubt, the killer. Thanks to forensic science and some good police work, Robert Fraser was convicted of first degree murder and and sentenced to death. What did you guys think about this case and my makeup look? Please let me know in the comments down below. <clears throat> I don't know what that was. If you like videos like these, you can check out my other episodes. I'll leave a link on the screen right here. Like, comment, subscribe, and share. Please share because it really helps me out. And I'll see you guys next week with another true crime story time. Bye.